Okay. All set. I think. Nope. There we go. All right, here we are, finally. Week 12 of 12, Blended Families. This one is called To Earn Respect, Give Respect. It's the uh, basic reap what you sow principle. So if you're sowing respect, you'll get respect. I always like to start this one off with the golden rule since we're talking about respect. Um, I got a couple of different versions of it here. Uh, first one is, he who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's not it. Uh, do unto others before they do unto you. <laughs> okay, just kidding, all right? Uh, the real ones are found in Matthew 7.12 and Luke 6.31, which basically says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? So treat people like you want to be treated. That's the way it goes. That's the real one. Um, okay, so a lot of times I'll start off with whatever the topic is, kind of defining what the word is. Like, so in this case, I have respect equals the value you assign to a person. And then in parentheses over there, the unfortunate part of that is it's based on your judgment of other people. Right? Now, down here I got respect each, especially spouses, but other people in general, especially your spouse, as a unique creation of God. Okay? Now, see, everybody's created by God in His image, but we tend to put values on them based on how we see them in our flesh. It's, it's difficult for us to actually see other people as being created by God. Because if we, if we saw everybody else that way, then we'd treat them very highly valued. We, we would assign a very high value to, those, to everybody because they're created in God's image. But we tend to assign a value to other people based on our judgments, prejudices, you know, all that kind of fleshy stuff. So different people end up with a lot of different values. Um, I guess this was... I was the generation just before this. But... So I, I'm like sort of responsible for that generation. <laughs> uh, being parents of people born in there. Uh, that was the me generation. So, you know, the parents really didn't do that good of a job of teaching those kids about respect. And, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of respect. There's self-respect. There's respect for authority, respect for your elders, you know, all that kind of stuff. But they never got that. It was all about them. Every, the, the mistake the parents made was, what would you like? okay and then you go get it you know computers were coming out all the technology was coming out everybody had to have the latest and greatest you know everything and uh, even clothes all the name brands and everything all that kind of stuff so this particular generation grew up thinking the world revolved around them and now we're dealing with their kids <laughs> right, and as as we know, you had third and fourth generation; those generational curses keep piling up. And uh, we watched a movie about John Paul Getty the other a week or so ago, and you know it, it's interesting how that generational thing works because there's the one that builds the empire, and his kids grow up. Sometimes they work in the empire, right? But they never had to create it. They didn't think of the ideas or anything. And then their kids just, oh, it's just normal. 
so they don't value the work that went into building the empire, right? So that third generation is usually kind of you owe me. Yeah, you owe me. I'm entitled. It's my right. Uh, yeah, it's my right to be you know rich and famous, and you know I didn't have to earn anything. So it's it's important to you know, like a couple of weeks ago we were talking about teaching your kids, right? And and the parenting stuff. Well, and we did a wedding a couple of weeks ago, Larry, and uh, Marjorie, um, it was the grandmother of the groom, said, this new bride that's coming in mm -hmm. feels that she has to start at the oh, top, yeah. uh, including the list that she made out for the wedding gifts. I mean, I don't think there was anything on that list that was under $140. <laughs> It was incredible. And she says that she wants the top of the line cake and the top of the line uh, outfits all to match and this and that. And Marjorie said, you know, where do they get off? They can, they can just start at the top where this is what we have, you know, not build together and slowly get there. But this is what a lot of people yeah. may even feel. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's... I want better than my parents is what... Marjorie, yeah. Right. You know, we all want to do better than our parents, but the mistake is we want to start where they're leaving off right. Right. and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah. So that misconception is kind of where things get all messed up today, right? Um, okay, so back to this one, Psalms 139, 14. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God and... We should respect, like you said, especially our spouse. But in a blended family, that's really important because you're showing all these kids from who knows where <laughs> what respect is. And more than likely, that's not what they saw before, right? Otherwise, there might not have been a divorce. Right, that's right. I mean, it's, it's not always a divorce, you know, Spouses pass on. That's a whole different set of circumstances. Um, Ephesians 5.33 Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. I didn't write that part in there, but it's in there. Wives, respect your husbands. Okay, there's a little more after that, but I just talk a period. That's good enough. Now, I got some arrows and different things here. One of the reasons that this scripture is even here is because, of, you know, God is telling us what we need to do, but we can't do what He tells us without the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right? So, He's telling us to do the opposite of our nature. Okay? And the, the example that we were taught was, you know, for, for women who are mothers, they, they just naturally love their kids. You know, for the most part, right? There's always exceptions to the rule. But you don't really have to tell a mom to love her kid. That's just what she does, right? It's instinct, like. And for guys, now, the, the best example for me is like at work, like in an office or whatever, it doesn't even have to be an office, just at a job. Guys, when it's mostly guys, it's just it's all about respect. Most guys don't go around, hey, I love you, man. You know. <laughs> I mean some do, but for the most part it's it's strictly a respect thing, you know, it's you know, you're my boss, so I respect you because you're my boss, right? You're signing my paycheck and you know, all that kind of stuff. So we get respect. That, that's our language. Love is the language of our wives. So we, God tells us to love our wives, and He tells our wives to respect us. Because that's not what we usually do. That's not our nature. So these little lines here, it's like, love is the need of the wife, or, or in other words, the wife needs love, and the husband needs respect. Okay? Now, self-respect is necessary, right? 
Because we're, we, we know we're created in God's image, so we need to respect the fact that we're made by, by God in His image. So we need to respect ourselves, but we also need to stay humble. Because if you start thinking too highly of yourself, now there's pride and all sorts of ugly things start happening. Uh, okay, so this next thing is you know, set goals and then meet them. Uh, I like to talk about this one here. The respect is earned by doing what you say you're going to do. This that obviously applies mostly to the guys, but it applies to everybody. But as a husband or a father, you know, if you're if you tell your wife you're going to do something, do it. If you tell your kids you're going to do something, do it. Uh, one of those few things that we did right when we got married because mostly we did it wrong but we did some things right sort of by accident but right after we got married it happened to be just before Christmas so like that week between Christmas and New Year's was a good time to sit down and make some goals and so we got the kids involved and everybody set goals for themselves we set some for the family we set some for us and one of the, the funnier things was the little four year old at the time it was okay. We got to have like a three month thing and a six month thing and a one year thing. And yeah, back then it was before the internet, so you actually like had to cut pictures out of magazines and catalogs and so forth. But she cut some pictures out and put them on a page, and we stuck them on the refrigerator so we could keep the goals in front of us, keep keep them in our in our focus. And <laughs> she got the the first one pretty quick. You know, we gave her some a little bit of allowance, and so she saved up some money, and she got what she wanted. But she was pretty smart. She said, well, okay, I got that one. I'll just go get another short-term goal and stick it up there. So she was all about getting the short-term goals. You know, she didn't think that, yeah, she wants the short ones. And get one, put another one in there, get that, get it, you know. Uh, no, that's not how that works. You got the first one, now let's get the next one. All right? So... And then uh, one of ours at the time was a newer car for Carol. Uh, okay, we got married in 79. She had a 76 Cutlass. Olds Cutlass, which, I mean, they don't even make Oldsmobiles anymore. But things kept falling off of it. And back then, it was one of those, you shut the car off, and the engine says, no. I'm going to keep running for a while. <laughs> so one of our goals was, at least by the end of the year, was to replace that. Okay? Uh, we got married at the end of 79. And so all these goals were mostly for 1980. And, I don't know, it was sort of September-ish. August. August. Yeah. We were able to trade it in on a 79 Thunderbird. So it was like 12, 13,000 miles. It was like a year old, mm -hmm. right? White with baby blue rugs. <laughs> all, all white leather. And a moon roof. <laughs> wow. it, was, it looked nice, but it had issues. Uh, it was kind of like you just replaced one problem with another one. No, it wasn't that bad. Actually. Well, <laughs> she loved that. She loved that. You'd be driving it down the freeway, and it just says, I'm done. <laughs> it would just quit. So they figured out it was a circuit board. Yeah, it was that. It was almost in the same spot every. Every time. It was, you know, the electronic ignition. The, the electronic stuff was still fairly new then, right? And the best thing was we got it to the dealership, and it died. And then they couldn't get it started. So they figured out real quick what it was. And then after that, it was okay. But anyway, um, so we set goals, and we met them. And, you know, the well, he would have been 16 by then was kind of blown away that, wow, it's not even the end of the year and you've already done all this stuff. Because we had never been told anything about having goals or stuff like that. I'd been married before and we never did anything like that. This was all new to us. So, Wonderful. yeah, the son was just, oh, Larry, you've done all this and it's not even the end of the year. What are we going to do the rest of the year? He was really <laughs> impressed. Um, Slide. <laughs> no, no. 
Um, but as you do what you say you're going to do, my example is that of like the bank and currency exchange. You know, you have a foreign currency, you know, pesos or Canadian or whatever country the money is from, and you want to get U.S. dollars. Well, you got to go somewhere. And, okay, I want to sell my whatevers to buy U.S. dollars. Well, they say, okay, well, we're buying at this rate and we're selling at that rate. And as you do what you say you're going to do, the currency exchange rate goes up. Okay, now guys, your wife is the bank. She's going to set the exchange rate. <laughs> so the more you do what you say you're going to do, the higher the rate goes. Okay? And if you say you're going to do stuff and you don't, well, the opposite happens. The rate goes down. You don't get a whole lot for your money in that case. Um, and the same thing with the kids, when you make promises to the kids. Like this year, our family trip is going to be to, say, Disneyland. Everybody wants to do that. Right. And then, say, four months before the end of the year, you maybe you have had to replace a refrigerator or a washing machine or put new tires on the car. And there is no way that you're going to reach that goal. So we suggest you tell the kids right then and there. You know, we've had some emergencies come up. I'm sorry, but this year we're not going to be able to make this trip. We're going to put it on the calendar for next year. But let's talk as a family where else we can go. But don't just be silent about it. Let them think that they're still going to go. And then the night before say, we're not going. Don't do that. You know, be honest with the kids. Yeah, that's... The thing about goals is, you know, like Carol said, if, if you're honest with your kids or your spouse that, you know, well, this happened, we weren't really expecting it, so, you know, this unexpected expense came up and the money we were saving for the trip or whatever, you know, it's the new set of tires, it's a new appliance or you know, the hole in the roof or whatever happened, you got to spend the money on that. You can always reset the date, right? You don't have to just throw the goal away. You just move it out a little bit so but it, the honesty and just being up front with your family you know especially the kids if it's like a Disneyland thing or something or even if it's just going to a water park right whatever it is it doesn't have to be a huge thing you know you almost have to mortgage the house to go to Disneyland anymore <laughs> uh, so you know you you do your best to meet the goals and if there's an issue and meeting it, then you just be honest about it and say, you know, hey, we need to change the date. Reset. Yeah, just, you know, we got to start from here and go towards that goal again. It's, I mean, it's not that really big of a deal. Um, That's all. Okay. It looked like you were ready to no, say something. I'm listening. Okay. Um, any other comments, questions? Anybody? Bueller? <laughs> no. Okay, so uh, moving over. Am I going to be in that picture? I want to have a back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll be right in it. Oh, no. Yeah. Come sit with us. Okay, I'm going to move this over to the other board. Oh, you really want it. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty good. Okay, so there's basically two different kinds of respect, all right? And we need to really understand the differences here. Most people think, and the thing we hear most in our counseling is, well, I'll respect you when you do what I expect you to do. you got to earn it before you get it, right? Well, we just talked about how it's earned, right? By giving it. And, the, you know, as you set goals and you meet them, you earn more points, right, in the respect column. But there's respect based on position, and there's respect based on performance. Two different things. 
uh, we look at the first and the fifth commandments out of the Ten Commandments. And the first one was, you know, have no other gods before me. And then number five was honor thy father and mother. That's a respect based on position. That doesn't have it doesn't say anything at all about if they do anything. Right? But then there's, you know, the promises kept part of it, which is respect earned through performance, like we've been talking about. And the respect for position goes back to Ephesians 5.33, Husbands, love your wife, and wives, respect your husbands. It, well, the one part of the performance that's in that is husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Right. Now, it doesn't put anything like that in there for the wife. It just says, do it. <laughs> um, but wives are supposed to respect their husbands because they're their husbands. It doesn't say anything about performance. It does say the guys are supposed to love their wives as Christ loves us. Because otherwise we wouldn't have a clue how to do that. <laughs> right? I mean, we're not really that smart. But... <laughs> I said because we're that smart. Right? Karen. I was thinking about that, you know, about you know, position and performance. And I think about when we first meet that significant other, that special person in our life, we fall in love with them and we get married on expectation, but basically it's because of, you know, who they are. Irregardless of what they've done so far. Right. We just in love with that person. At least what we think that person is. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, what? No, we don't have, we don't, I mean, we have words of expectations, mm -hmm. right? but really we kind of fall in love with them for who they are. Yeah. Until something tells us different. Right, right. And, and that's why we, we shouldn't jump into things, right. right? Because like they teach us, you know, when you start a relationship with somebody, it's just basically two representatives. Oh yeah, You're, right. you put on your best clothes. You put on your best face. And, um, then after you get married, hair and curl is, don't put any makeup on. Is the yeah. Comes out. You don't shave. You yeah, don't. Guys. Yeah. You know all that good stuff. Yeah. But and we we talk about this in the the premarital class, right? There, there's all these questions you need to answer. Mm -hmm. You need to ask and get an answer for. Right. Before it, it, you say I do. Before you say I do. And, and and one of those, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. And we play a, a Creflo Dollar video. It's five or six minutes or something. And he just goes through a whole bunch of, I need to know. Or you need to know. And he tells you what kind of questions to ask. Yeah. But one of them that I found very significant was, you know, it, like it was a woman, you know, she's, oh, I've never seen this guy angry. I'm just so in love with him. And he's like, you need to see this guy angry. You don't even know this person. Okay. Right? <laughs> and because that angry guy usually doesn't show up until after the wedding. Right? <laughs> right? Well, and that's, that's the thing. You know, we're, we're on our best behavior when we're courting. We don't want anybody to know all the where all the warts are and all the bad stuff. <laughs> you know, we're all that and a bag of chips. But God says to do certain things based on who people are. Who they are. What they are. Not what they're doing. Now, in our humanness, obviously, you know, we see what people do. We see the fruits of their actions and so forth. Uh, how they talk, how they act, and those kind of things. So, we assign a value to them based on what we see and hear. That has nothing to do with position. Right? That's just strictly performance. But we have to understand those differences. And Karen had mentioned, you know, we have expectations. And that's always a big deal because, you know, just I think it's part of human nature to have expectations of others, right? I mean, you, especially other Christians, you expect other Christians to act like Christians, right? 
Well, a lot of people say they're Christians, but a lot of people say they're Christians because they live in America. They have no idea what that really means. So, just because somebody says, yeah, I'm a Christian, well, you need to find out. You need to discern the spirits. You need to check the fruit. You know, we should all be fruit inspectors. Right? But, uh, as... As you spend time with somebody, you know, you're building a relationship, you find out, are they doing what they're saying they're going to do? I mean, do they, do they live up to their word? Uh, or do they just expect you to be respectful because of their job or, you know, whatever? So, uh, the expectations thing, you know, too many times we have very high expectations of others. And what, what we found over the years of counseling is people will expect up here and they'll talk down here. Right. You know, they'll expect like a spouse to be up here and then when they talk to them, they're talking to them like they're down here. There is no way this person's going to get up here if you're talking to them like this. No way. So we have, you have to manage your expectations Lower them a lot of times. Yeah, and there's a restaurant down the street here. It's under a different management now, but it, it's mostly they still got all the same stuff on the walls and ceilings and all that kind of stuff. And one of my favorites was if our food doesn't meet your expectations, lower your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> you have to manage your expectations because if they're too high you're going to get disappointed and in a marriage with spouses if you're disappointed in your spouse because they're not meeting your expectations then you're going to get bitter and pretty good chance there's going to be a divorce down the road because because that's where you're going to focus. You're going to focus on the bitterness and the, the unmet expectations and they're just a, a lousy person and all this kind of stuff. Yet, you're probably not a lot better, right? Well, and we're not each other's parole officers. Yeah. We're not supposed to point out each other's faults. If we can't speak with love and respect to one another, don't speak at all. And a lot of times the women, being aggressive like... I am, and, and really used to be bad, I have no one to shut my mouth. Pick my battles. Is it really worth that little dig I want to say? Is that really worth it? Yeah. And that's where the Jesus glasses that we have come in. What would Jesus say and what would Jesus do? Not what I would say and what I would do, but what... Yeah, we have some new folks. Jesus. These are our Jesus glasses. You know, everybody needs a pair. Before you open your mouth or before you act. You need to be looking through these. Yes. So everything is filtered through the Word. Right? Through the Holy Spirit. Put them on. Now, these look, everything looks blue with these, but... <laughs> Everybody should have a pair, just even if they're just sitting around, just to remind you, right? When you talk about expectations, sometimes we have to also make sure that we don't have unrealistic expectations of each other. That's true. For ourselves. Yeah. And so sometimes that can discourage people because we have based our expectations on something that's either not healthy or not mm -hmm. very realistic. Yeah, it's it's really, and I think it really fits with the respect thing. You know, like I said, you need to have a healthy respect for yourself, but healthy means you're humble. You don't think too highly, but you know you're valuable so that you respect yourself. But, uh, you know, you got to keep that humbleness in there so you're not, you know, all that. And because you know, other people get turned off by somebody that's very arrogant and, you know, it's all about me, you know, that turns people off pretty quick. Um, okay, one of these things, now we were here at a marriage conference many years ago and there was uh, a guy here by the name of Emerson Egrich who wrote a book called Love and Respect. And he's a pastor, he'd been a pastor for 20 some years, and, you know, every year he'd go through the Bible and all that. And he's the one that really, when, when he got to Ephesians 5.33, like we talked about, you know, husbands love your wives, wives respect your husbands. 
it finally kind of dawned on him that why isn't it just love each other? Why is it different for me and you? Why is why aren't they the same words? So that that's kind of where it came from that you know we have to do the opposite of what we're our instinct is. You know, God had to tell the men to love and he had to tell the wives to respect because that's not our nature. So when we get in the flesh, now last week it was all about responding in grace and not reacting out of emotion, you know, the difference between those two things. And I just want to point out on this crazy cycle or I call it marriage, merry-go-round, it's we're talking about reactions here. That's like a clock. Yeah, it's kind of a clock. And, you know, we can look at it the opposite, the, the counterclockwise way, and then it, it, like, it works when you do it the opposite way. But our flesh, because it is what it is, it wants what it wants when it wants it. Uh, we start off like at 12 o'clock, and it's basically without love, she reacts okay, reacts without thinking reflex without respect so when a woman doesn't feel like she's being loved she's going to react by not respecting right been there <laughs> done that right Amen. everybody does this we still do it sometimes. We'll you just have to realize you're on the ride. Right? Now, when the wife starts withholding the respect on purpose, because you don't feel, I don't feel like you're loving me. Right? So, mm hmm. And so now, without respect, though, he reacts, again, reflex, without love. So, around and around you go until somebody says, time out. <laughs> you know, now we, we did, especially when we were first being counseled, which is 15 years ago now, we did this a lot. Because yeah. she sure didn't think I was loving her, and I sure didn't think I was being respected. <clears throat> you know, so we, we got on the merry go round a lot. But we also knew that our spouse is not our enemy. Right. And marriage is spiritual warfare. Now, if you don't get anything else out of this whole class, if you, if you can get those two things, you'll be way ahead of the, the rest of everybody else. Marriage is spiritual warfare. Life is spiritual warfare. Marriage in particular. But everybody does this. Everybody. Christians, non-Christians... The, but now that you know, you can, oh, yay, we're on the ride, let's get off. Right? And somebody needs to recognize it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always have to be the husband, it doesn't always have to be the wife. Somebody just go, you know, hey, time out, we're on the ride. Just say, hey, we're on the ride. And then you should both know what you're talking about. Okay? But every couple that we've ever counseled, with does this and you know like Carol said you know, we catch ourselves every once in a while you know she'll feel like I'm not loving her enough or I'll feel like she's disrespecting me or something and then I'm like mm, you know and, and then around we go but we only go around once or twice and, you know this is getting old I mean, wait. it might also be noted that second marriages is another degree of spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. Oh, very true. And so, Amen. recognizing that we're all in that same category, mm-hmm. you have to put on that extra degree of protection in order to avoid that spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I always like how you present that. I mean, you guys have been married 40 something, right at 40 years, blended family the whole time. Six kids. Six kids between you. Lots of opportunities for disaster. Right? Amen. But because you were faithful to put on the armor of God every day, some years down the road, it's like, you know, there's all this stuff that never happened. You know? And sometimes we forget that part. That it's not that 
we're being blessed necessarily, but we're not being attacked, we're being protected. which is a blessing. We were obedient to the word. We didn't hear nothing else. You know, we well, just had yeah, to it. but yeah. see that, that just says you know, as you are obedient, you know, God would rather you be obedient than sacrifice, right? right? So as you are obedient, He blesses you, and He keeps Satan away from you a lot more than if you're not. A little further explanation of that. We were, of course, not... Uh, when we had married, we were walking with the Lord, but we were very immature and new. But we did receive the teaching, and I can't remember exactly who was responsible, but introduced us to placing on the form of God according to Ephesians 6, 10-20. And I was obedient in doing that, not knowing, but we had all kinds of disaster potential and that we bypassed and we were also led to do many things that were not normal that were a blessing to us as doctors Larry and Carol have uh, so adequately addressed in in this and so it was a true blessing because we avoided so many things and how do you look back on your life and say oh wow that never happened to me you know, then you don't realize it's because you put yourself in position with God to avoid. And you can't calculate what you've avoided. You just be blessed by being there in it. Yeah. And you guys shared those audio things with me. We've only listened to the first one so far, but... Well, don't listen to just the second one. is is crazy good. <laughs> You, you get attacked right away. Oh, okay. You know, we'll it's make sure we get prayed up. <laughs> yeah. And the, the first one was about mercy and judgment, right? And respect kind of goes in line with that. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit, right? And I mentioned it over here. The respect is the value you assign to a person based on your judgment. That's right. Not... Are they good or are they bad? But you're judging them and their character, and so you're assigning some kind of a value based on how you see everything, right? But you know, and that thing, as it says in the in the scripture, judge not, lest you be judged, right? So if if you're looking at someone as less valuable than somebody created by God, there's judgment in there. And it's the same yardstick. Whatever you're measuring, you get measured with the same yardstick. Uh, Keith Moore and his wife, that's where we got the... um, She says, if you're going to judge, if you're going to be the umpire for that person and say whether they get a strike or not, and they do use all these different analogies, and we're baseball people, so... um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I wonder why. So just mark it on your calendar. It's going to happen to you. Just just put a place on the calendar somewhere because if you've judged, it's it's coming up. And it's coming up for you. Whoa, wow, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, how many times? I, maybe you don't actually hear it, but you know, people talk. I think the this the saying is, small minds talk about people. Uh, then there's whatever the next step up is they talk about things or events and then there's the really good ones that talk about the ideas you know like creative or whatever but the, the lowest end of that scale is just talking about other people right and you know gossip is one of those things we're not really supposed to do but just remember when you're talking about somebody else there's somebody talking about you And mostly it's not good, right? Because you're getting judged. Somewhere else, maybe you don't even hear it, but somebody's talking about you, and it's probably not good, right? So respect is is the topic of this lesson again, is the value you assign to a person based on your judgment, your beliefs, your uh, prejudices, and all that kind of stuff. And, and back in the beginning of the class, we were talking about who's normal's normal, celebrate your differences. And one of those things is, you know, Satan wants to show off. I mean, God wants to show off in his creativity, right? So he's got all these different kinds of people. 
But they're all in His image. Satan wants us to fear that which is different. So then we start judging and assigning low value to other people that are different and, and stuff like that. So uh, everybody's created in God's image and our challenge as Christians is to see other people in His image and then love them. Even when they're not real lovable. That's, you know... Being, becoming a Christian is easy. Being one is hard. Mm-hmm. I think you said it, but another word for respect would be honor. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, let's see. Where it was... I know it was somewhere. Oh, yeah, over here. Uh, I hadn't actually got to this one. Proverbs 1-7, through 7, the first part of Proverbs. Mm-hmm. Right, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Right. Well, the, that fear is reverence or respect. Mm-hmm. It's not like, ooh, scary. It's... A reverence and a, and a respect because of God's position. I mean, His performance is pretty awesome, but it's His position that we really respect Him for. Because of who He is. He's God, right? He created us. Um, and a couple other things here. Proverbs 16.31, Leviticus 19.32, it talks about you know, the, us gray hairs. You know, y'all are supposed to respect us because we got gray hair. Oh, 1631. 1631 and Leviticus 1932. Right. Yeah, the, the gray hair is a, like a badge of honor. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, if there's not a lot here, maybe some down here, you know, that, that works too. You know, back in the day, most everybody had a beard, so. Maybe not so much up here, but they all had some here. So, and that would be gray. So, but see, we lost that a couple of generations ago. You know, God was taken out of the schools. Nobody talks about God in the school anymore. They don't teach respect for much of anything. And so now we're stuck with people that, you know, they don't care about you unless you think the way they do. And then they don't really care. They just, oh, you're on our side. You know. Um, so I'll leave it up for questions, comments. Yes. I didn't want to talk a little bit about the, the first cycle there. You were talking about the anger, about he couldn't understand about why you know it should be easy because we should love each other. But when he broke it down, I think with him breaking it down, like that that's how the other person interprets love. When we talk about love one another, mm-hmm. because women will think to love their husband is to love like they love the, like Gunger talks about that love language. <laughs> well I'm going to love you the way I want to be loved right? and if that isn't interpreted love to the man the man interprets love as respect Yes. and so those are two opposites so it's kind of like we're speaking in each other different languages right, right. He, see if a wife is telling a husband I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you I love you and disrespecting him it doesn't count what does it mean? I'd like guys to make a list of how they feel respected. Exactly. That's what I exactly. really like well, to thought yeah. of that before. Oh, yeah. Well, one of, uh, my, my first example would be one that we've wrestled with, and that was you know, from years and years. Carol would always say, she's very strong-willed, you know, I inherited her three kids, and so it's all, you do what you want, I'll be here for you, you know, all that kind of stuff in the beginning. But In the beginning. In, in the beginning. <laughs> but, and then it, it, it became, one of those issues, those little foxes, you know, it was like, she say, you need to take the trash out, do this, do that, you know, whatever, Okay. You need to do something. Kind of like, I didn't hear her saying it though. Would you please, would you do me a favor? I need this to be done. I can't use the word need. I can't even say it. You can say need, just don't put a you in front of it. (laughs) But to me, that's that's a a good example of the difference between respect and disrespect. I did not mean that. Well, I'm just saying, and that's what and that's what Karen's trying to get at. It's it's not what you meant. It's what I heard. 
Yeah. That's how I heard it. Yeah. I said need anything. You took it as need do something. Well, I, I took it as a command. Not doing something. You know, it's the difference between my wife commanding me to do something versus just asking me nicely, you know, would you please do something? And, you know, with the would you please, oh, sure, no problem. But, you know, there's a mule gene in here that, you know, when when somebody says you need to do something, it's like, no. I think it's about tone, tone of voice. Oh, sure. It's about I can say <laughs> this has everything to do with the basic communications of all people. Yeah. And that is goes back to this is what I said. Okay. What did you hear me say? Right. Okay. Yeah. Been that ensuing that conversation sure, that will Natalie. get you to the point of understanding what I meant to say yeah. and understanding what I meant to hear, you know, and that goes for and we've satisfied ourselves many years by defining that first and then going into the discussion, which was a discussion and not an argument. Right. That's huge. So instead of saying you need to take the trash out, say, get the trash. <laughs> Well, now see there, there's, it's, for anybody that knows anything about like the technical stuff of grammar, right? Yeah. You need to or get. It's like the same thing, right? No, but the, the, yeah. Oh, uh, I know I just joined the class, but That's I, fine. I would like to add something to that. As we're uh, talking about words like love and respect, it, of course it's our human definition that gets us in trouble. Right. One of the things that I found throughout life is I was reading God's word and learning it year after year. It transformed, it became part of my heart. So as I began to meet people, uh, and if I learned to have the love and the respect that the Lord gave us because he created us, and if I was entreated in that manner, I felt that I was worthy to be treated that manner because that's we're made in God's image. Mm -hmm. So I knew how to cut the rope immediately you know, when there was <laughs> yes. yeah. So what I learned later is that by continuing to read God's word, we do become in his image the more we read it. However, I also learned that even though I read it for many years, when I stay away from his word, I tend to oh, quickly yeah. move back into yeah. being part of the yeah. whole yeah. realm. It doesn't take long to get back no, to the old self. Yeah. Because I'll catch like myself if I hear you, as I hear you saying, uh, sometimes uh, my uncle says that I need to be a little more patient. Mm -hmm. And me, with me, it's, well, how long do I have to be patient? <laughs> how much longer? And yeah. so out of frustration, you know, you do things and you say things out of frustration. And that's because I, I, and I can catch myself very easily. I say, how long has it been since you read the word? <laughs> uh, and because I'll catch myself doing that. And, and sure enough, well, I've been away from it for two months or three. It, it you, you change immediately. You can quickly fall back into sure. the realm of yeah. the world. Oh, yeah. So in order for this to take hold of your heart, my only recommendation to people is it has to be part of your life every day. The Lord's Word, His right. readings. Right. Because He tells us how to be, and we become in His image. And once we become in His image, we expect to be treated that way, and we mm -hmm. easily can treat people in that same manner. Right. Right. That's very good. And yeah. as as we stray, we also stray from the the thinking that God is sovereign, right? When we believe He's sovereign over everything, especially what we're doing, it's easier to be committed and do the daily stuff. It's, it's like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, God's out there. He's watching over me. You know, I mean, He's there, but He's not sovereign, right? And we sometimes we lose some of that bit you know, and we tend to just kind of start doing our own thing and knowing he's there but not doing everything we should be doing 
know, be, but, be there when we need to phone a friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And you know, we have you know we have some friends that have the red phone. Oh yeah. And then we others that's a you know put a quarter in. You know. It's, and one, it's, one of the things I found when you're saying that. He's generally when he he's sovereign always, and he doesn't leave us. We tend to leave him. Oh yeah. That's why we don't feel that closeness. Right. It's because we've separated ourselves and we become part of the world right. instead of continuously being in his realm. Well, one of the good examples of that was uh, the late Pastor Leo was describing like a spotlight, mm-hmm. you know, like on a stage, you know, and if you just think about it, okay, so the spotlight is is there and it's like stationary it, it doesn't move but people can move in and out and our nature is we like darkness yeah. so we we tend to move away from the light so we can do our thing and then things go crappy and then we get back in the light <laughs> right <laughs> you know but uh and Andrew, and I yeah. One thing to add to that, and I did live that whole life, you know, and I lived a life of having to earn it. And okay, well, I did this sin, so now I can wait six months before I can pray, <laughs> before I have to do all these good deeds, and then I can pray six months later. Do all that and penance. One of the things that was real to me in my healing, um, and, and it's to tack onto what she's saying, is is that I didn't realize this, but I mean, I, I if anyone met me, they would have been like, Angie is a prayer warrior. She would just pray, 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 and I, I would. But one thing that was revealed to me um, when I was when I was dying and, and God saved my life was that that I believed for you and you and you and you and you, and I would pray for you and you and you and you, and I would ask everybody to pray for me. But I didn't believe that I was worthy. Yeah. So what I I'm a visual person, so the way I describe it is is that we have like I call it God's gift barn, like you know, ten times inside the Costco, right? <laughs> and so each one right. of us were born and we got this big gift barn and your name is on the top. You know, my name's Angela Chance. Mm-hmm. Born Angela Skinner and it has big neon lights with these beautiful doors and it's like come in and get me. And there's all the gifts that he gave me two thousand years ago just waiting. But I was in front of those doors, dying of 45 diseases and in a wheelchair and a walker and losing my, completely lost my mind, like, mentally and with, like, early onset stuff and leaving my family because I didn't feel like I was worthy enough just to open those doors and receive those gifts. Mm-hmm. And I had to get to near death <laughs> to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it, that's and huge. Some people have to go down a very challenging, challenging road to get there. And praise God, He stayed with me <laughs> because we just got married January first, and we've been together for eight years. Yeah. So we've been through lots and lots of backwards. We did it backwards. Yeah, what? Well, and that's and, um, that's what I mean. That's the basic salvation thing, right? Everybody's got a gift with their name on it. Yes, under the tree. Oh my gosh, and now every day is Christmas. And For real. I mean, even these things happen, like some of the most tragic things have happened in our lives, in my entire life, in the last six weeks. I mean, yeah. I never thought some of the things, I mean, I never thought, I've never had to deal with them. I've never had to experience them. There are things a mother would never want to know or learn or hear. Miracles are popping up. My dad was found after 30 years missing. We thought he was dead and was alive. And, wow. and so it's like, but then there's tragic, but there's miracles in every single thing. And I call, I call them God kisses. Yeah. And and when you just say, okay, I'm going to receive, I'm going to receive what it is today yeah. that you have for me. Right. You got to go through the door to get the blessing, yeah. right? And then sometimes I'm still out there and like the doors are shut. And I'm like, get back in there. <laughs> are you kidding? Yeah. And you know, there's that gift under the tree for every single person out there. But if you don't open it up, no. You're still, it's still sitting there. It's that old adage of you can lay a horse to water, but you can't make them. So I, I had yeah. all those there for me thinking, and I was... Sometimes you stick their head down. Me. I was, right. you know, I'm rejected, they don't want me, and I wasn't good enough, and it was all right there. Yeah. All all a couple of, people. two or three weeks ago, we were just talking about, you know, well, actually it was week six, so half of the semester ago, we were talking about, you know, the, the vertical relationship and everything. Yeah. But it, it was all about your identity, who do you think you are? Versus what do you think you are? That's true. Right? So uh, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, so we'll, we'll end the video here. 
and the recording and all that. But we do have it's graduation day, uh, so we're going to be giving away some diplomas and college credit and all sorts of good things. And uh, we'll be back in September. Okay.